Now, more than ever, we must support the men and women in blue. In the last two years, America has seen a tragic rise in violent crime. In 2015 and 2016, we witnessed the steepest two-year consecutive increase in murders in nearly half a century. And you look at what's going on in Chicago. What the hell is going on in Chicago? What the hell is happening there? For the second year in a row, a person was shot in Chicago every three hours. You don't think these people in this room can stop that? They'd stop that. They'd stop it. And just north of our nation's capital, in Baltimore, on average, someone was murdered nearly every day of this year. Police departments are overstretched, they're underfunded, and they're totally underappreciated, except by me. Instead of holding up our police as the role models and mentors they are, they have been subjected to malicious attacks on their character and their integrity. This anti-police sentiment is wrong, and it's dangerous, and we will not stand for it. Most concerning of all, we have seen an alarming increase in violent assaults carried out against our police officers. Last year, an officer was assaulted in America, on average, every 10 minutes. In 2016, more than 140 officers lost their lives serving in the line of duty. These deaths fill our hearts with pain and with grief. Every drop of blood spilled from our men and women in blue is a wound inflicted on our nation. And when a brother or sister in uniform is hurt, on that day, all of America bleeds blue. I want to send a message today to those who threaten violence against our police. We will protect those who protect us. And we believe criminals who kill police officers should get the death penalty. One of my first executive orders as president instructed the Department of Justice to take all necessary steps and legal action to protect law enforcement from acts of violence against them. The Department of Justice has also announced more than $98 million in grant funding to help your local police departments hire desperately needed new officers. Also, just as I promised, we are allowing our local police to access surplus military equipment, something the previous administration, for some reason, refused to do. Weapons, uniforms, trucks, even mine-resistant vehicles used in Iraq and Afghanistan are seeing a second life in U.S. police departments. According to the Indiana Department of Administration, last year alone, the state saved approximately $14 million, and this year it's set to save around $13 million. Indiana law enforcement officials say the new gear is needed to protect the public from increasingly heavily armed criminals. Joining us today is John Whitehead, president of the Rutherford Institute and author of A Government of Wolves, the Emerging American Police State. Sir, thank you very much for joining me. Now, according to these jurisdictions, using anti-mine vehicles, uh, etc., one officer offered this reason for, for uh, their need for more sophisticated weaponry. Sergeant Dan Downing of the Morgan County Sheriff's Department stated, the weaponry is totally different now than it was in the beginning of my career. Plus, you have a lot of people who are coming out of the military that have the ability and knowledge to build IEDs and to defeat law enforcement techniques. Are Sergeant Downing's concerns legitimate, in your opinion, about returning veterans? Not what I see. It sounds like paranoia to me. Like there was an Indiana sheriff who recently said he needed an MRAP, which is the mine-resistant armored protection vehicle, which is 25,000 pounds and 25 foot long and basically a tank, that, he, uh, that America was in a war zone now. Uh, 
if that's true, then we're in, a, we're in a bad state of affairs because if we're in a war zone, that means that the police are the military, uh, which means that uh, the American citizens are enemy combatants. That's the new paradigm, in my opinion. If, if that's the way the police are viewing us, we're in trouble. But Explain that one. Explain it to me, please. Never understood that one. Somebody out there can explain. Anybody want to stand up and explain it? That'd be tough. The heavy-handed police response to uprisings in Ferguson prompted former President Barack Obama to reform a program allowing war weapons to be transferred to local police departments. Three years later, the new American leader occupying the White House supports a further militarization of police, as RT's Marina Portnaya reports. The sniper rifles, armored vehicles, and tear gas used by law enforcement during the Ferguson uprisings did more than just shed light on America's policing tactics. The events also turned attention to the Defense Department's 1033 program, which allowed local police departments to obtain military weapons no longer used on the battlefield. In the aftermath of Michael Brown's shooting, former President Obama reformed 1033, aiming to demilitarize the police. The transfer of certain weapons like bayonets, tanks, and MRAPs are prohibited from being sent to police departments. However, America's new commander-in-chief has promised to reverse the reforms, recently calling 1033 an excellent program which enhances public safety. You know, when you want to take over used military equipment, they were saying you couldn't do it. You know what I said? That was my first day. You can do it. In fact, that stuff is disappearing so fast we have none left. You guys know how to you you really knew how to get that. But that's my honor and I'll tell you what, it's being put to good use. In the meantime, it appears the 1033 reforms put in place were in name only. Earlier this year, the Government Accountability Office says it ran a sting operation by creating a fake law enforcement agency and applying for military gear. According to a report released in June, the GOA's fake agency obtained $1.2 million in war weapons from the Pentagon. Well, some of the equipment that they received included night vision goggles, simulated rifles, um, infrared illuminators, and according to the GAO, some of the equipment that they could receive could have been um, made deadly using e publicly accessible materials. On the third anniversary of Michael Brown's death and the protests it provoked, the fate of 1033 and other similar programs remains in the hands of a president who believes the country's civilian police are making good use of weapons made for the battlefield. Reporting from Miami, Marina Portnaya, RT. Heavily armed United Nations peacekeepers operating in some of the most dangerous corners of the earth. Now there's a push to bring them here. Good evening, I'm Rob Johnson. And I'm Erica Sargent. A Cook County commissioner wants to get the peacekeepers to Chicago to battle our violence problem. But it would be an unusual move. Consider this from a U.N. promotional video. Peacekeepers often operate in hostile environments where others cannot or will not go. CBS2 political reporter Derek Blakely picks up our story. They've helped stop the fighting in war-torn hotspots across the globe, from Syria to Sierra Leone. Now a Cook County commissioner is appealing for U.N. peacekeepers in Chicago's crime-ridden neighborhoods. I know that uh, there are those who say that this is an admission that we can't protect the people in the city, but quite frankly, we haven't protected them. But one Westside alderman whose ward is plagued by violence rejects the military analogy. This is not war. I mean, we may have, have some daunting statistics, but again, uh, military intervention is not the answer. Alderman Irvin says it's an economic intervention, not a military one, that's needed to stop Chicago's violence, jobs, and investment. And Mayor Emanuel insists progress in crime-fighting technology and community policing is reducing shootings and killings at high-crime areas like Inglewood. For all of us that know what Inglewood has stood for before, it's different. And it's the residents saying it. It's not some social scientist saying it. Tonight, after the meeting, Boykin said the assistant secretary general told him one circumstance under which he might come to Chicago. There is a global study that the UN is working on regarding youth and violence. Once that is published, he said that he'd be delighted to receive my invitation to come and to talk about the contents of that study. 
Now, according to Boykin, the Assistant Secretary General also said the U.S. mission at the U.N. could invite him to Chicago as well, but that is even more unlikely. And either possibility is a far cry from peacekeeping forces on Chicago streets. Nevertheless, Boykin insists that Chicago needs help, desperately needs help, and that too many Chicago officials want the public here to turn a blind eye to inner city violence. Robin Erica, a lot of politicians believe that Boykin is simply grandstanding here, but he is betting that his constituents will see him as thinking outside the box and give him credit for doing everything he can. Have we seen any other leaders in other cities try something like this before? No, this is something completely unusual. I mean, uh, completely out the box uh, because the UN, you know, intervenes in hostile situations, uh, civil wars, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And even applying that tag to what's going on in the streets of Chicago, of course, is something Chicago leaders do not want. We've heard various leaders say bring in the National Guard, but we've never heard anything about the UN peacekeepers, have we? Another step. Right. Another step. A right. United right. Nations step. report reveals new details on transactional sex by UN peacekeepers. And some of the most startling findings concern Haiti, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. The Associated Press, which obtained a draft of this report, which is to be released later this month, found that members of the UN peacekeeping mission in the country had bartered goods for sex with more than 225 Haitian women. But the report, which was compiled by the UN's internal watchdog, looked at the problem of sexual abuse in all peacekeeping missions, which employ around 125,000 members. Now, according to The Guardian, some of the key findings were that one-third of alleged sexual exploitation involves minors or those under 18 years old. Help for victims is, quote, severely deficient. And on average, an investigation into these allegations takes more than a year. Now, in the case of Haiti, the report states that for rural women, hunger, lack of shelter, baby care items, medication and household items were frequently cited as the, quote, triggering need. Now, those who conducted the investigation in Haiti interviewed victims who listed shoes, cell phones, laptops, perfume, and cash as some of the goods exchanged for sex. Now, in many of these instances, the women were unaware that the UN policy prohibits transactional sex. Now, for human rights activists in Haiti, this report is unfortunately nothing new. Azili Danto, human rights lawyer, joins us now. Azili, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, what is your reaction to this report? Is there anything in it that you haven't heard before? There's nothing I haven't heard before, but I think that it's always misleading when the media calls it or the UN calls it transactional sex, because you know they say it for themselves. You know, you look, you can't have it both way. You can't say that. Um, uh, well, they said one third of those 225 are children under 18. Children cannot give consent, so it can't be transactional sex. It has to be rape. Um, it's pedophilia. You know, we're not using the right words. Um, and so we're acting that somehow the rural women in Haiti um, are doing some sort of fair exchange um, for this, this, this exploitation. Um, even, you know, for, for, we say at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership, all contact by a fiduciary, a, pow a power that's supposed to be about protecting and serving um, in that manner is rape, is exploitation, and it's not transactional sex. But we're not surprised by the figures. I, I think the figures are vastly understated. This is the story of how international peacekeepers are accused of betraying the trust of some of the world's most vulnerable people. In a at night it was very cold, and the man offered my son a pill, claiming it would warm him. It took my son five minutes to fall asleep, and the soldier violated him. It's the story of children being abused and of a culture of impunity. In July 2014, I informed the French government about allegations of French soldiers uh, abusing children in Central Africa Republic. Nine months after that, uh, I was asked by the UN leadership to resign. And when I refused to resign, I was forced out. The scandal began in late 2013 at this refugee camp, an airport runway, where French peacekeepers protected thousands of people and their children from violence between rival militias. They and the UN helped to prevent genocide but some are accused of becoming sexual predators. After the rape, he was crying and afraid, but the soldier reassured him and said not to mention the rape to anyone. Their son was 13, 
They alleged the soldier then threatened to stab him if he reported the rape. At first, our child tried to avoid us, hardly spending any time at home. When I asked why, he explained what had happened. His friends were mocking him because of the rape. Now he takes drugs and won't go to school or socialize with his brothers or sisters. The peacekeeping operation was launched by the French, but it would soon expand into a full UN mission. As peacekeepers from other nations were deployed, the allegations of abuse multiplied. Explain that one. Explain it to me, please. 